Let us say hello to the pride of Australia, the host of the Grayson Waller effect, the one and only Grayson Waller. How are you, my friend? <laughs> you forgot to mention Madison Square Garden main eventer. You that's, didn't put that in right. there, but that put that in there. Debut, for me, if you can debut just say that at MSG. Main event in Madison Square Garden and debuted. How many people debut at MSG at the Mecca? There he is, Grayson Waller. My my apologies. That's okay. That's always, I, Was it Leroy who was just in there then, man? Those English guys are boring, aren't they? I nearly <laughs> fell asleep waiting to come in for this interview. I was so excited. These British boys, man, they say they have banter. I don't know about that. I was having a little snooze on the couch. So hopefully I'll, I'll wake up enough for you now, mate. I appreciate it. Uh, by the way, did you guys win the Ashes? It's very confusing. Like this thing goes on for like eight weeks. I'm very confused mm. what's going on. We, we did. There was, a, there was a big game this week and uh, it rained out. It got rained out so they couldn't finish the game. So on a technicality, Australia retained the Ashes and we're, we're taking that. I, I couldn't be happier. Piers, Piers Morgan's complaining online, that flop. I, I couldn't be happy. If, you, if you're going to win, any means necessary. I'm good with it. Amen. All right. Well, congratulations. And congratulations on all that you have done over the past few months, my friend. Wow. How, how do you even, could you even describe this? Like coming up, the, the effect that you've had, the impact that you've had, MSG debut, in-ring debut, the show being brought over from NXT, your talk show, Grayson Waller Effect, in there with John Cena at a pay-per-view. Come on, you, you have exceeded your expectations, right? When you thought about how you're going to come in there, main roster, you didn't expect all of this, right? Yes and no. Obviously, it's been bigger than what I kind of expected it to be, but I always expected to come in on the same level as these guys. I didn't want to be that NXT guy who comes up and works his way up the ladder and is respectful and all those type of things because I just I just don't think that works anymore. And for me personally, like, I was coming off a broken leg. I broke my leg, you know, two weeks before the WWE draft. So to have all this happening where the first six weeks on the main roster, like, I wasn't cleared. I couldn't wrestle. I couldn't actually do anything. So lucky for me, I'm super charismatic. I'm super talented. I brought over the talk show. We had Charlotte Flair. We had Asuka. We had AJ Styles. Like, from the beginning, I'm in there with, with the biggest names in the company. Uh, and that's where I anticipated to be. I don't know if I anticipated to be so quickly, but, you know, I, as Edge said, I swam. I don't think at any stage during any of that did I look like I didn't belong in there with these people. Uh, when you broke your leg before coming up, did you think, oh, man, I'm so close. This is all going to be delayed. It all mm. worked out perfectly because it kind of, mm. I think it, it, it made us anticipate the debut even more because you were, you were there but not active. Were you worried initially, though, that this would delay everything or ruin everything? Very, very much so. I don't know if you know this, but the WWE draft is, is real. The NXT talent who get called up to Raw and SmackDown do not know. So wow. we go to the draft nights, and we have no knowledge of what's going to happen. No, there's like two or three people there that kind of know. So we have no knowledge. So I had that match with Carmelo Hayes, who's the NXT champion now, and I broke my leg doing the Shane O'Mac through the announce table. And when I came backstage, like I knew it was bad. And it was kind of very emotional because not only did I, did I lose the title match, but now I can see the draft disappearing. I can see, cause I, I thought this is, this is my time. I'm definitely getting drafted, but then you get the injury and then I was second guessing myself. And then I don't know if you saw the draft, but I was there both nights, both nights are about, you know, two, three hours. I wasn't drafted on either of those shows. I wasn't drafted on raw. I wasn't drafted on SmackDown. So I had to sit there in the room, people getting picked all around me, people who aren't on my level, people who, you know, are talented, but they're not Grayson Waller talented. So I was, I was annoyed. I was hot. I was not happy with the whole situation. And then I ended up getting picking the last pick, Mr. Irrelevant, if you want to, you know, use NFL terms. I was Mr. Irrelevant, which is ironic because there's nothing irrelevant about Grayson Waller. But that kind of put a chip on my shoulder in a lot of ways because I, I said, okay, you think I'm the last pick? Watch what happens. And I think I've exceeded any expectation that people had for me. When, when you came over, did you think that they would bring over your show as well? I was hoping so because I think, you know, especially on the main roster, it, it's wrestling, but it's entertainment. It's not just what's happening in the ring match-wise. Like, there's the entertainment portion. And I think what I showed with the great small effect on NXT is that I'm a great middleman for that. If you have two people that don't like each other, put me in the middle. I'm happy to instigate as much as I can. If you want to bring a legend out, you know, Shawn Michaels was on my show before. If you want to bring in a legend and reintroduce them to the audience and have, have someone start some trouble, I'm, I'm going to do that. So... I hope they would. I thought they would, but I didn't know that it was going to be basically the same show. The set's the same. We still have the comments down the bottom. People say so many nice things about me during the show, so you've got to make sure people can see that. Um, but I think it's the, the same vibe that it was in NXT, which in the past hasn't happened with the transition to the main roster. Right. A lot of times things get changed up and the NXT fans are upset because they're like, 
oh, this is what we liked. But I think this time there is no difference. Yes. Nothing pisses me off more than we, we, we get emotionally invested in someone in NXT and not only do they come up and they're different, they have a different name. It's like none of this happened. Yeah. I feel like that's <laughs> insulting the audience. It's like if someone comes up, to use another analogy, like from AAA to the major leagues in baseball, mm -hmm. you can't just repackage the guy. That's the guy we fell in love with in the minors. Not to say that NXT is minor, but you get what I'm saying, right? You get called up. We want to, we want to yeah. follow that guy you know, to the top, to, to the top, not, not change him. No, I couldn't agree more. And that's something, when I was a fan, I noticed the same thing. But the great thing about NXT now, and it's going gangbusters, the, the ratings are through the roof of that show, is there's more connection between NXT and the main roster. And you can even see it on Friday on SmackDown. Mello and, and Trick Williams were there. You know, Stax and Tony D were there. They're, they're implementing onto the show. The main roster's coming down to NXT. And the product that they're building in NXT is what they want to then use in the main roster. So those people who have, complained in the past that, oh, I like this, but then they brought me this. Now it's going to be a much smoother transition. And I think I'm a great example of that. I think Pretty Deadly are a great example of that. Zoe Stark is what you saw in NXT, it worked, and now it's going to work on the main roster. Who's done the talk show better than anyone in the history of WWE, in the history of the business? There's been a few over the years, right? There's of one course. that comes to mind in, in my opinion, but I want to hear your answer. Who's been the best in this role? I don't think there's any question that it's Roddy Piper. All right, that was And I know yeah, he's, yeah. he's kind of the, the first one, so sometimes it's a cop-out to say that, but when I initially got the talk show, I watched a bunch of Piper's pits. And like his ability to instigate and just his energy and vibe during them, I, I think it's untouched. Miz, you have to talk about too, because he's done it for such a prolonged period, and it doesn't matter who he's in there with. Miz is always super entertaining, but I just don't think you can go past Roddy Piper. That's the one, yeah. Piper's pit, iconic. Um, speaking of the Miz... Uh, so LA Knight gets gets a little bit of heat because people say he's ripping off Austin and and The Rock. Yeah. You get a bit of heat because people say you're you're ripping off The Miz. Now, dare I say, it's one thing to be compared to do those two legends. Liz, a, 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 you know, he's a legend in his own right, but he's not quite the Austin. Do you get annoyed when people say you're ripping off The Miz? I would get annoyed if The Miz sucked. Okay. If they're comparing me to someone that sucked, fair enough. But The Miz is he's a multiple time world champion. He's a WrestleMania main eventer. He's at a talk show. He's literally done it all. Why would I complain about people comparing me to him? And I can see the comparisons. Like we both did reality TV. You know, we're both very confident in ourselves. We both say how we feel and we have no, no qualms about telling people that. So I can understand the comparisons. But I just think, especially people on Twitter, they just have no intelligence. So the easiest thing to do is, oh, this person's this person. Like they just don't have the intelligence to see the difference between right. people. I don't see it. I really don't at all. Other than the... Oh, the reality show thing, and you know, you have like similar color hair. Like, I, I really don't see a lot of similarities between the two of you. I, I actually think you're way better on the microphone than he was when he came in, like this this early in your in your run in the main roster. I think even microphone wise, I think we're different. Like, I, I say what, way wilder things than the Miz does. Mm -hmm. You know, especially online too. I have no shame going out there and instigating and saying the things that I shouldn't be saying. Like, I think I play with that line way more than The Miz. I think The Miz is fantastic at what he does, but I do something completely different. Have you received... But who knows? Maybe I'm here now. Maybe maybe me and him, you know, one day. You never know what's going to happen That would now. be fun. Uh, young guy coming up, saying the things that you're saying, especially about some of the older guys, the the legends, if you will. What's, uh, <laughs> what's the reception like backstage? Well, I, I'm in the locker room this time. So in NXT, you know, Bron Breaker kicked me out because I said some wild stuff about certain people. But uh, I, I think people understand who I am and what I do. I think they've seen my stuff in NXT and who I've worked with before and they understand it. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be super polite to me and want me to be be around. And, and, and I get that. I, I go in there fully knowing that. But what does it do for me going up to the main roster and shaking hands, and kissing babies and asking, oh, AJ Styles, can I please get a photo with you? Oh, you're my favorite. Like, I'm a wrestling fan. I grew up loving wrestling. Like AJ Styles, Shawn Michaels, these are my favorite wrestlers. But I'm on their level now and it does nothing for me to still act like a fan. Like I would be embarrassed in myself if I made all this effort to get here and to get to where I am and then I just want to be a fan of everyone. Like I just don't think that does anything for me. And I think that happens in MMA too. You see people who fight a legend and it's there and they don't put in the same performance. Mm. They don't want to put them down. They don't want to take them behind the shed and, you know, put one in the head. I want to, because I think the best respect I can show these legends is to go at them as hard as possible. I think I'm showing them respect in a different way. 
Uh, and and I want to ask you about your uh, MMA fandom. I'm very interested in this. But uh, how did you find out that you were going to headline MSG in your mm-hmm. debut? Uh, so I, I knew that Edge was going to be on the show. They kind of got announced the week before in Money in the Bank. So that that was already cool in itself. MSG to me, like I'm from Australia, but I understand the the venue in itself. And you know, the night before. I think I found out maybe the day before that this was a match that could be happening and it could be the main event. And this is my first back from my injury. So I'm already stressing. So I sat in my hotel room and I watched, I watched Reggie Miller uh, in MSG highlights Come that started firing me up. Really? Yeah. No, nah, you know, that was eight points in nine seconds, nine yeah. and eight, whatever it was. Yeah, like yeah. I, I was watching that and then uh, watching Connor and Eddie Alvarez and all the background of that in that venue. Like, and it just fired me up and it completely got me ready. So I had 24 hours and I was super nervous. But then once I started watching these people who have performed in that venue and lived up to expectations, like I felt 100% ready to go. So that's why you you did the hands behind the back in honor of of Connor against Eddie Alvarez at MSG. 100%. Because I've always been a huge Connor fan because he is who he is. You know, I, I, I love that he says what he has to say. I think Connor's a professional wrestler. He might not be in a professional wrestling ring, but everything about him is professional wrestler. The way he talks the way he moves, the way he, he builds his fights. He's a professional wrestler. He'll never admit it. You know, he does the Vince walk and everything. Um, <laughs> but that whole story, I loved watching the video because so many people were talking about how Eddie Alvarez was going to expose him. They're like, oh, this is it. He's going up a weight class. There's no hope. And I love people discounting. And he went in there and it was, it was easy. He did it easy. So that's why I was like, I want to show a little bit of respect to someone I, uh, I look up to and, and did the little hands behind the back thing. Do you think of that in the moment or did you think you, you know, like, did you kind of plan that moment beforehand? I didn't really plan it beforehand. It just kind of, I it kind of felt it. You know, like I look across and that's edge. Edge yeah. is a hall of famer. And this is, he, t- uh, a few people said to me before the show, like, enjoy the moment. So when I looked across the edge and I was like, I'm going to take this moment in and then I'm going to get to work. And that's just what I felt at that, at that moment. And it's kind of cool. Like looking back, I'm glad I did it. Are you happy with that debut match? Not at all. No, not at all. I understand like people backstage were happy. People online thought it was a good match. But for me, I'd been out of the ring for eight weeks, even longer. And I hadn't been able to train at all because of my schedule. I, we were in London. We were here. We were here. So I just felt that I wasn't at my best. I felt that that was Grayson Waller at 60%. And I'm not here to be good. I'm here to be great. So that, that watching that match back was hard. But now that I'm starting to get... A, back to 100% healthy, like, uh, I'm going to improve on that performance. And if I ever get in there with Edge again, like, I'm putting him down for good. What was it like when you walked back and, and went through Grill? Like, was there someone in particular that uh, said something to you? Is there a moment? Is there an interaction? First time walking back as a main roster guy, is there is there something that sticks out that you'll always remember? Yeah, Michael Hayes told me that it's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, he's not wrong. I had, you know, John Cena in O2 Arena the week before. There's a lot happening at once. But to be honest, it was so such an emotional roller coaster. Like after it just you stress about it so much, you think about it so much, and it just happens so quickly. It feels like it's seconds. So it, it it was cool having some of my friends that are up there coming over and saying congratulations, welcome back, those type of things. But the one that'll stick with me is Michael Hayes telling me, uh, it's all downhill from here. And so let me ask you about uh London. Uh, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. I felt it. Like I said, it felt like you were a 20-year vet going toe-to-toe, verbally sparring with John Cena. Is, is, is that surreal for you? Like, you have a moment there where you're like, holy crap, I can't believe I'm in here. And I'm, I, like, I'm up here, and it doesn't look like I'm, 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 I'm not on his level. Like, I'm, I'm floundering in this mm-hmm. moment. What is going on in your mind as, as you are just verbally sparring John Cena, the mm-hmm. legend? The weird thing is, is... I, I felt like I'd been there before because I put a lot of work into what I do. I work very, very hard. So if you don't think I've, I've thought about what I would say to John Cena, if I stood across from him, like I've thought about that many times. It's very funny. Myself and Carmelo Hayes actually a few weeks before had talked about it. Like if you were ever in there with Cena and he came at you because we've all seen before Cena goes in on people. He doesn't hold back. Like he's going to tell you what he thinks. And, and I love that about him. I think it, I think he is like the measuring stick on the microphone and he tests people. You see kind of what he did with theory earlier in the year. I think he was testing theory the way he talked to him and and put it on him. So 
I've thought about that moment so many times. And when I went out there, I felt completely comfortable. Like I've thought about being across from you. Your music's not going to scare me. Like you standing here is not going to scare me. Like this is, this is where I belong. And that's the attitude I kind of bring into these things. And I think that's why I look so comfortable. I work hard so that nights like that are easy for me. They're, they're the nights I get to enjoy. So you said that like you're not so happy with the edge match because you were a little rusty. Happy with that interaction? <clears throat> I, I I guess so. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm ever happy with anything I do, but like, I think I showed a lot of people who I was. Cause I know online people were complain like, Oh, oh, he's just a talk show host now. Cause people didn't know I was hurt. And they're like, Oh, what's he even doing? He doesn't belong there. And then all of a sudden now everyone switches and goes 180 cause fans are so easy to you know change. And now they're like, Oh wow. He's so good. And it's like, get off the bandwagon. I don't need you guys on my side. Like I knew I was that good, but I think I proved myself not only to people, but like to the people backstage because no one knew John was there. So I'm walking around all day and people are kind of like, why is, why is he here? The SmackDown crew flew home yesterday. And I was like, oh, you know, just hanging out. And then obviously there was a <laughs> wow. someone hiding in the halls of the O2 Arena. That is incredible. Uh, and the crowd, like they were eating up everything that you were saying, obviously didn't love everything that you were saying, but it was just a tremendous <laughs> back and forth. So a lot of credit to you for that. Could I ask you, uh, why did you want to become a pro wrestler? Like what made you fall in love with all of this and this life? I always loved it since I was little, which a lot of people kind of say like, and I, I don't know what it is about it. I think it's just such a perfect mix of so many different things. Um, there was a time in my life when I was, you know, turned 18 where I got deep into the UFC and then I changed my mind. I wanted to be an MMA fighter. I went and trained for three, four years. I trained with Rob Whitaker. Probably doesn't remember me because he used to beat me up every, every day. Um, but then it, I just didn't have the passion for it. I didn't love it. Like it was fun. But I think with MMA, you have to be all in. If you're not all in, it can get really dangerous. So I just knew it wasn't for me. And then when I finally went and started wrestling properly, I was like, this is it was day one. I knew this is, this is what I wanted to do. Because it's the wrestling part is fun. I love getting hit. I love hitting people. But then I love to entertain. I love to say really mean things to people. That's one of my favorite things to do. I don't know if you saw over the weekend, I ripped Bingo from Bluey in front of that crowd. That, that, was, that brings like so much joy to my heart, seeing how sad that guy was that his balloon got popped. Um, <laughs> so it's just something about wrestling where it has so many different aspects to it that, that I enjoy and I can kind of do a full performance if that makes sense yeah I, I knew you were a big MMA fan I, I didn't know that you've actually trained in MMA and you trained with Rob Whitaker wow how long did you train with him I think I trained for him about 3-4 years so what? he's from the same area yeah he's the same area as me he was a shy boy in Sydney so we had mutual friends growing up so like in high school I knew of him uh, and then I started training with him a little bit. And obviously he was, he was the guy at that time. Um, and kind of everyone already knew how good he was. It just like, he hadn't had the opportunities uh, that he would get later in his career. So it's always great seeing Rob killing it because I feel like, you know, when I was 18, used to punch my head in and, and be really nice afterwards and give me advice. Like he's always been such a good bloke, uh, which he didn't need to be with how talented he was. Were you shocked by that result against Strickers Duplessis? Yeah, that, that was a rough one. That was, so that was the night after Madison Square Garden. I stayed in New York for the night to watch the fights. And uh, I don't know. And I've heard Rob say some stuff online about how it was kind of a wake-up call he needed. And maybe that's the thing. Because you guys, that guy's got a big family. Like, he's yes. a busy boy. Like, <laughs> it's, it's hard to commit 100% like you did when you were 22, 23 and had no obligations. Now he's got his family. He's got his wife. I'm sure he's got a lot going on. So it's hard to have that same level of commitment. But I think that fight will just bring out the best in him. And I, I'd be very worried if I was the next guy Rob's fighting. So did you ever actually fight? Did you have any amateur fights? No, I, I, I trained a bunch and I did like, you know, we would do like sparring, big sparring nights and things like that. But it was just, I just knew in my heart that I, I had to give a hundred percent. Like I had a job at the time I was doing uni, like I was, I was half in and with MMA, you can't be half in because that's mm. how people get hurt. So I always kind of did it more as a hobby than anything to stay fit. Okay. So this is like 15 or so years ago, right? Yeah, quite a while. Like, so I was like between 18 and 22. Right. Um, so, but, I, but I got a little bit of knowledge. So if I ever get in there with, you know, uh, Julius Creed's down here, he's a big amateur guy. And uh, we got uh, Gable Stevenson now. So if I ever jump in there and they try and shoot a double leg, like they get the double leg, but at least I fight like just a little bit. Yeah, like yeah. I have that half second of, oh, and then yeah. Gable dumps me on my head. Yeah. So uh, then curious, why did it take so long for you to get to WWE? Well, I started training. Like, I didn't start training until I was 25, which is very rare kind of in, in wrestling. But I was out living my life. I lived in the States doing things. Like I got my uni degree as a teacher. I did all these things. And then once I started training, that was it. That was my full focus. And 
with the Australian scene, it can be very hard to get noticed. Like there's some really talented Australian wrestlers, but it's super difficult for people to see you and give you the opportunities because we're so far away. So lucky for me, I got seen on the right night and, and got brought here, but people didn't know, people had no idea who I was on any level at the performance center. So, uh, I just had to keep working my ass off till people paid attention. And if that didn't work, I just said really uh, inappropriate things until people paid attention. What, what kind of a teacher did you want to be? Oh, oh, actually, I was a history English teacher for about six years. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, what, people, don't be- <laughs> people don't believe that. <laughs> yeah. that is. And uh, how old were your students? Like what grades? So for my first, I was mostly a sub because I, I, I did it on the side. Even when I was wrestling, it was like my, my job on the side. Uh, so originally I taught like kindergarten, like elementary kids, like little kids, which was wow. super fun. Uh, but then eventually I went up to the high school kids, like 10, 11, 12th grade. Any of those kids know what you do now? Do you, like, do you ever hear from them? Yeah. Every, I, on Instagram all the time, I'll have some of my old students reaching out, that type of thing, which is, I think it's cool for them to see because they, I hid that I was a wrestler for so long, but then I would always be coming into work. Like I'm a high school teacher. I'm coming with a black eye or I've got a sling on one week. And I'm, there's only so many times you can say, oh, I was playing basketball with the boys on the weekend before right. they, you know, kids are, kids are smart. They worked it out. And, uh, but then they, were, they all loved it. You know, some of them thought it was silly, but a lot of them thought it was cool that their teacher was a wrestler. I'm sure if I was in high school, my teacher was a wrestler. Like that would have been the best day of my life. Yeah. Tremendous. And then you were on Survivor Australia, which to me sounds like, like hell. I like, there's, there's no, there's nothing I would rather do less than go on Survivor. How was it for you? It, I always told people it sucked. It was it was horrible. It was the best like life experience I've ever had, but it was a terrible experience at the time because I was trying to work out how do I get people in wrestling to know who I am because mm-hmm. no one knows Australian wrestlers. So I was like, I'm going to go on reality TV. So I ended up going on Survivor and it was fun. I loved the challenges. The challenges were fun. I got to talk a bunch of trash, like do all that thing. But then there's there's no food. It's cold. Like everything you see is real. People think that like survivors kind of, oh, you go stay in a hotel. No, we were just left on the beach all night, like freezing cold with no food. So it wasn't the most fun experience, but it was a great life experience. I'm glad I did it. Um, but I don't know if I'd ever do it again. Do you think that if you don't do that, you don't get to WWE? <clears throat> I don't if, know if that necessarily, but I think it gave me a lot of confidence coming out of it because people started to know who I was. And I got very lucky. The night I got signed, we had a tournament called the Coliseum Tournament. There's a company in Australia called PWA. It's the biggest company in Australia. That's where I train. And I ended up winning the tournament over two nights. And Canyon Seaman at the time was the, uh, uh, was the recruit from WWE and he got to see me. So I don't think if I did Survivor, I might not have been you know, the winner of the tournament with all that hype behind me. Maybe he doesn't see me the same way and then maybe I'm not here. So I think a lot of things kind of fit into place um, for me at that time. Okay. Um, I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, uh, but when we first met in Los Angeles, uh, you, you when met- I beat you in darts, right? Well, when I beat you in darts, I sort of threw it. I was doing a gimmick where I suck at darts. I'm actually really good at it, but I wanted the wrestlers to beat me for the video, uh, so I was sort of I was working. I didn't see the video. Okay, yeah, I was working. Um, anyway, you mentioned you mentioned Chael P. Sonnen being uh, someone that you've really enjoyed. C- could I ask about your uh, admiration of Chael, especially on the microphone? You know, I'm, I've always been someone who, who who likes the bad guys. I don't see any value in good guys. They bore me. And, you know, <laughs> ever since he, you know, he, he beat Anderson Silver in that fight, you know, 4-1, four, four rounds to one. That was such an incredible performance. Um, but I think Chael's another one who is, he's a pro wrestler. Yes, he was an MMA fighter, an amateur wrestler, all these things. But he was a professional wrestler. He went out there and he said whatever he had to say to get people in, invested. You would know, like, his early fl- fights, no one was paying attention because he would just take people down and, and, and hold them there and they'd have not be able to get up. So people weren't really excited. Then all of a sudden he starts saying things about Brazil. He starts going off at Anderson. He starts saying all these things. And I loved it. Chow Sonnen is my kind of MMA fighter. My first favorite MMA fighter was Josh Koshek for the wow. exact same reason. Like he just was who he was and he wasn't apologetic, but he also knew what he was doing. He was drawing people in and, 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 and I love that type of vibe. So Chow, Chow, Chow's a hero of mine. Like when I, you had him on recently and he, you mentioned um, me to him. That was like the coolest thing ever. I got all the respect in the world for Chow. That is awesome. Yeah, he told me he's going to be a fan of yours, as uh, did Connor after I uh, posted the thing. And he was like, tell me about this Grayson Waller. He seems like a good guy, all that. So now you got two pretty big legends following you. No problem, by yeah, the way. And that's You're the welcome thing, like... for that. No, Don't mention it, okay? <laughs> no, no. I, I got the Ariel Hawani rub. Yeah. Um, but that like, 
I envision like I don't know. I'm I don't think I'm that far off getting world title matches. And and when I do that, like I've always enjoyed like the MMA vibe of having people walk you out. Oh, Chow's ever available? I'd love to have Chow walk me out. And Connor, like he could walk me out, but I I, I genuinely think. Grayson Waller and Conor McGregor as a tag team at a WrestleMania is something that, that could happen. I think Conor is going to find his way to the WWE in some way. And I think I'm the perfect person to help him with that. Like, wow. put me in with you, bro. I got no problem doing that. And I think, I think that's something that's going to happen. You know, I, th- my next question was just going to be if you think that Conor will end up in WWE. You, you've, everyone seems to have an opinion on this. You, you, you think he does? I think 100%. I know, I know online he says never and he, he doesn't like wrestling and he, and he says those things, but he, there's too much money to be made. And, you know, you can only fight for so long. And, and he's another guy who has so much happening in his life. It's hard to commit 100% to, to the fight game. But for wrestling, there's, there's people who do it part-time. Look at Logan Paul. Logan Paul is a part-time guy, but he's really, really good at what he does. And he's great to watch. He. He's making waves. He's wrestling at WrestleManias, and I think Connor could do the exact same. And especially now that you're going to be under the same umbrella, it feels like it's easier than ever to make it happen. Very much so. And I think all he would need is that one night, and I think you get the bug. And I think Logan got the bug. Like I think at first he was just doing that as a bit of fun on the side, and then he was like, this is really, really fun. Like I love doing this. So Maybe not as much at Money in the Bank when he was going through ladders, but I think yeah. the other matches, uh, Logan's loving it. And I think Connor just needs to, to jump in and I'm more than happy to be the guy that brings him in. Uh, who? Okay, so you said that you would love for one of those guys to walk you out. If you could walk out one MMA fighter, who would it be? I think right now it's it's got to be one of the Aussies. It's got to be Volk. I'm a huge Volkanovski fan. Um, what he's doing right now for Australian MMA is like another level. Like he's he's the best pound for pound fighter in the entire world, and he's from Australia, and he's doing it easy. So I love watching what he's doing. I would love to come out with him. He, he's from a similar area to me as well. Um, I know a few years ago, uh, he was, I think him and Cejudo were supposed to have a fight. Okay, yeah. And Cejudo was doing stuff with AEW. So Volkanovski actually talked to the school, PWA, that I was from, about maybe coming in for a show, doing some stuff so he could kind of build oh, wow. to the Cejudo fight. Uh, but it never came through. So I was really just because I was supposed to actually do some work with him. Um, but now let's, we can just do that on a bigger stage now. So I saw, it was the day of that fight, July 8th, you went to Yankee Stadium, you were rocking the Volk t-shirt, right? So that's your guy. Yeah, Number one, yeah. is he your favorite right now? Right now, he's, he's my favorite, just because uh, I, I love representing my country. You know, every time I go out and wrestle, I have the Australian flag all over me, and I think Volk's doing the same right now for the Australian MMA scene. So uh, any, any Australian like that, I'm fully supportive of him. Like Taito Ivasa, I'm a big fan of too. He's from my area. I guess it's all the Sydney boys, you know, Western Sydney boys taking over. Um, but I'm doing the shoey too. And that's something that like, you know, I saw him doing and I was like, I love doing that. I think that's Australian culture, how ridiculous the shoey is. So now I just need to bring it to WWE. And so I haven't got a main roster shoey in yet, but it's coming. Wait, so the, your shoey came from seeing Ty do it? 100%. There was Ty and like uh, Daniel Riccardio. So yeah. Like, I think that is Australian culture. And I was like, I remember I said to Shawn Michaels, I was like, hey, Shawn, um, I'm thinking of doing a, a shoey. And he just blankly looked at me, obviously. And I was like, oh, it's like, it's a Australian cultural thing where you put like beer in your shoe and you drink it. And I think because I said cultural, he didn't want to offend me. So ah. he just said, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so that's my new plan now. So if uh, anyone ever asks, like, oh, it's, it's, it's my culture. It's yeah, my yeah, culture. Yeah. But by the way, like you do it with new shoes, like, some, like what Ty does is disgusting. He has people spitting it and all this crap. You don't do that, right? Like you seem like. Yeah, no. No? I, it's my shoe. I do do it from my shoe. And sometimes I have to put it back on. Um, but the whole spitting in it thing, that, that was never something that me and me and my mates done. I think that's just Ty trying to take it to another level and he, he can have that. That can be his lane. He can go do, do the spit in the shoe. So you used to do this legit as a kid? Not as a kid, but I think when Ty started doing it, it started becoming a thing. Okay. So when I was actually wrestling independently in like 2017, I started doing the shoey on the indies. Oh so there's God. photos of me like six years ago doing it and, uh, still doing it now but now we're, we're making it a thing we're making sure because the americans are very confused they yes. really don't understand what's going on they just kind of let us let us go because we're stupid australians uh have you been to a ufc event or any mma event i have so i went to the original one in sydney i think it was ufc 110 which was velasquez wow. and the guerra yeah you were at that which one. was yeah i was at that one that was big and i remember because at the time george sotaropoulos was like he was our aussie guy yeah and i remember the whole crowd chanting for him that type of thing and they were fun because they were at they were like on Sunday morning at like 10 a.m. 
So we would go out at like 8 a.m. and start drinking beers to go and watch the fights at like in the morning. Uh, and then rec- most recently, I went to the UFC down in Miami. I live in Orlando. So I drove down to go watch Izzy fight. Uh, I've always wanted to see Izzy fight live. And that fight against Pereira, that was, a, that was a banger to go and watch. That was a lot of fun. Who are you rooting for in that one? Izzy, 100%. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm Team Izzy. He's in with Volk and all those guys. So I know he's not Australian, but... You know, New Zealand's close enough. We kind of just claim each other most yeah, times. Yeah, 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 for the most part. Uh, that was a tremendous card. UFC 110. Mirko Krokop against Anthony Parosh. Remember that? Parosh taking that yes. fight on like five days notice. And then I remember, I don't know if it was that one. Or those, the next one was 126 with BJ Penn and Fitch with Mark Hunt. 127. And then yeah. Mark Hunt. That was like one of Mark Hunt's first fights. Was it Chris Teixeira? Yes. Big, fat, blonde guy. Yes, I was there. Mark Hunt he was Brock Lesnar's... Uh, that, that, that's the only one I've been to in Sydney. Yeah. He was Brock Lesnar's training partner. And that was Hunt's first win because he lost to Sean McCorkle in his debut at 119. And everyone thought he sucked. Comes out and then he knocks him out. And uh, BJ Penn and John Fitch fought to a draw in the main yeah, event. Yeah, the, the, the main, event, main event really brought the crowd down. Because, you know, a lot of times for the Aussies, we want to see the Aussies fight. You know, that's kind of what right. we're there for. So, uh, but I remember Mark Hunt winning that fight and we were all big. I don't know how you can't be a fan of Mark Hunt, just this big Samoan bloke, just knocking people's heads off. So as soon as he did that, and then he went on a run after this. Yes. That was such a cool thing that he, he could have got his contract bought out, but decided not to and said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to fight my way. And then ended up winning. I think that's like a very Australian thing to go out and go, no, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show you what I can do. Were you at that car too? I was at that one too. Oh, yeah, my God. we were in the same building. We were. T- I'm, I might have bumped into you. I said hello, but you just you were too big no, for me back then. Yeah, so now true. now you're coming to me. That's true. That's true. That's a good point. Um, and then of course I'd be remiss if I don't ask you. I mean, the biggest question of them all: is there like some? Is there something happening between you and Dwayne Johnson? What is going on here? The back and forth again. Like you're hanging there. Like, what is happening? He's sending you messages. You're what's what's going on over here? Is there a seed? Look, Summer Slam is always a big show, and uh, next week we're in we're in Detroit for Summer Slam. That's a big show, and I think all of a sudden people start seeing what I can do for these legends. Like I think Grayson Wall is on the Leg- WWE Legend Rehabilitation Program right now. If you're a WWE Legend, it's hard, you know. Twitter, Instagram, you don't know how to go on the socials. Come and talk to me; I'll make you relevant again. And I think he saw me do that with John Cena. He saw me do it with Edge, and I think right now, like he's out of work right now. He's unemployed, correct? I, I mean, he, I, I don't keep up with his uh, his diary, but yes. But I mean, I don't know if he has a movie. But, but you know, we're, we're on strike, right? Oh, All the right. actors are on that's strike. Right. That's right. That's right. Yes, that's right. So technically, he's unemployed, and, and I think he needs some work. And who better to, to help The Rock than Grayson Waller? So I just sent out a little video. I didn't even tag him, mind you. So people who think oh, I was cloud chasing, I didn't even tag him. All of a sudden, he's coming back with the same insults he's been using for 15 years, you know. It, it, it was it was funny because I was like, oh, I remember when I was 15 and thought you were funny. Like, that was really, really cool. Um, but there's now an open invitation for the Grayson Waller effect. If he wants to come on the show, you know, I know he's, he's, his daughter's in a cult right now on NXT and uh, his family's in shambles on the main show, but he seems to be worried about Grayson Waller. So I think we have to do something about it because there's so, so many legends in town for SummerSlam, Ariel. I heard The Undertaker might be in town um, for SummerSlam. I heard whispers about Stone Cold Steve Austin. I'm hearing all these names being thrown around, and uh, for some reason, they they all want to come find me. So, if there's a legend in town that you know wants to talk to Grayson Waller, I, I'm open to it. So, there's a chance The Rock, Grayson Waller, Grayson Waller effect at SummerSlam. You think this is a possibility? It's not up to me. I think that's up to The Rock. Mm. Like, and, and he can make any claims or a better busy schedule. But I know you don't have a busy schedule now, lad. Like, you wake up at four a.m. to work out. You're done by about six a.m. <laughs> You got a whole day free, and I'll, I'll make my. I'm open the whole day. You know, you can get your workout in, whatever it is. I'm open, and I, he can say whatever he wants to me, and I and, and I think that will be a lot of fun. But we'll see if uh, if Dwayne has anything to say. Okay. Wow. Um, by the way, do you have a match at SummerSlam? No match on SummerSlam. Grayson Wall is too talented to wrestle. You know, I'm going to be there. I'm there for the tryout during the week, that type of thing. But uh, I'll, I'll be hanging around the day of, and who knows who's going to turn up. Money in the Bank, John Cena turned up. That's right. So, you know, they're always surprises to me too. Uh, two last ones. Poirier Gaethje, who do you have? Uh, these are the kind of fights where I don't think win and loss doesn't matter. Yeah. Because you know it's going to be such a fun fight. But I just have, I love Gaethje. Just because he, he, he could be such a good wrestler and really take people down and, and that type of thing. But he just loves to go out there and, and, and bang and fight for the fans. And that's always really cool. And Poirier, you know, 
he cheated and broke my boy Connor's leg, so I can't be I can't be celebrating him. So I got to go team Gaethje. Okay, and then uh, Diaz Paul. Oh, see, this is one. So I, I got to train with Logan maybe about six months ago. He wanted to work with Shawn Michaels, and Shawn Sean, Sean, Sean ain't taking bumps no more. So Shawn brought me in to work with Logan. Okay. And I know people don't like Logan. I personally do like him, but that dude is a natural talent. His athleticism is just so natural. And I think I've never met Jake, but I but I assume the same. And Nate's looking a bit slow right now. So I'm I'm gonna put my money on Jake Paul. I I, I don't want to do it, but I, I just think he's so naturally talented and, and athletic that I, I don't know if Nate's gonna be able to keep up with him. Okay, fair enough. Uh by the way, I lied. I had one more. And I don't want to put you in an awkward spot. I don't want to make it uncomfortable, but and you could whisper it, or you we could take it off the line. The answer, but how much? If you could just tell us how much did uh, Dylan Dennis pay you for that photo that you guys took? Because <laughs> there's no way in hell that an A-lister like you is mm-hmm. taking a photo with a jobber like him and posting it on your feed. That to me was the most shocking part. Like usually you just keep that in the you know private file, but you actually put. So how much was that transaction? If you could just tell us. Hey, you- you got to think about this, Ariel. You know, I, I, I love messing with people online. Mm. I love it. Mm. There's nothing that's more fun than that. What is more bad guy than posting a photo with Dylan Dennis? That's, that's, that's X-Pac heat. That's the wrong kind of heat. I don't know if you want that heat. Let's change the channel heat. You know what I mean? Just for... <laughs> Hey, they ain't changing the channel on me. I, I, you know, he, he was backstage. You know, he, he's coming around asking everyone for photos. And I was mm. like, I've got to get a photo with Dylan Dennis. That's the... That's a that's an MMA legend you're talking oh, about, right? <laughs> he is. He doesn't even fight. How many how many people are getting mentioned on your show and they don't even fight right. at all? He doesn't even fight, so he, he's doing something right, I guess. There's a few of those flops. I don't know if you have you seen Chase Demore? Yeah, he's that the boxing guy. He did a W tryout recently. That's another flop. I, I want to see Chase Demore versus Dylan Dallas. Like that, just that's two the one you idiots want? trying to. Yeah, it's just two idiots who don't know how to fight, just trying to fight each other. I think I'm paying good money. I'll pay seventy dollars to watch that fight happen. By the way, I like it. Now, now you went from posting him on your feed to calling him an idiot. Yeah, you know that's what Grayson Waller does. I, don't, I actually don't have any friends. That's why I'm sitting here alone right now. Right. You know, <laughs> I ain't got no friends. It's me and my dog, and that's about it. And you got a sweet poster behind you though, or whatever that is. That's I tremendous. Do. So this is the funny story about this. I, I'm, I'm assuming you know Fit Finley. Of course, legend. Yeah, so he he's a coach at the PC, very very close, helped me a lot. And uh, earlier in the year, he pulled me aside. He gave me a bit of a serious talk, looking like maybe I'm going to the main roster. And he told me, uh, he goes, "You need to get in there with these people and act like you're Muhammad Ali. You need to believe in yourself." And he told me about this photo. Obviously, I've seen it, but he was like, "You need to stand there above them and show that you're better than them." So as soon as he told me that, I took that to heart and I actually went and bought this and put it up in my house. So every day, I think about the fact that I need it act like I'm Muhammad Ali. Like when I go in there, I need to feel like I'm the best, not just say it. Is that why you wear the boxing trunks? Uh, that, that's part of it. The boxing trunks are mainly because I want to look different. I want to, I want to stand out. And, uh, I, I think the boxing trunks make me stand out. You can have a bit of fun, but my actual character is, is based more on Prince Nassim. Oh, wow. that was the first guy that really? I watched. I, you know, the leopard print and all those things. Like he was, he was Connor and Chow before Connor and Chow. I think Prince Nassim was like the OG, like trash talker, flashy fighter. Like you can even see the way I move in the ring. It's very Prince Nassim. That's because I watch his fights all the time. Oh, I love that. And I love the thing that you do with your knees, the up and down thing there. Yeah. That's fun. Did you, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's... Go ahead. No, I was just wondering if you copied someone for that or you came up with that on your own. So, so that's a, I don't know if you know, there's a guy, Chris Hero, uh, yeah. in, in, former WWE Cassius, I know. Uh, but when I was a fan, on I used to love watching Chris Hero. And he had this this period in, in, in his career where he didn't even wrestle. He would just do tricks, which I loved. And he used to do the lunges all the time. And so when I was on the indies, I just started doing it. And uh, it just kind of stuck. So that's a that's a little shout out for Chris Hero. Well, you are killing it, my friend. And um, you, you got a, a Mattel doll, right? A, an action figure, I think is the better name for it. Action figure, not doll. Maybe that's... So, well, I don't care. Like, I'm not gonna. They're gonna give me one anyway. I'm not gonna buy it. I'm not a nerd. I'm no. not gonna sit around with like action figures around my studio. Like, can you imagine doing that? Can you imagine being an adult with like with a child, but you have toys around? Like, that's. That, I would never do anything like that. But I know you wouldn't. No, no. I was gonna say it would look nice in the studio, but um, you know, maybe we can. You know, maybe we can rethink that. Uh, congratulations on all your success. I love the MMA ties. I love the boxing trunks. I love what you're doing on the microphone in the ring. 
it's a lot of fun to watch. And, um, you know, again, you know, now that you got Chael and Connor following your career, I'm invested as well because I don't want to steer them wrong. I don't want to tell them like, oh, this is the guy, buy stock in this guy, you know, metaphorically speaking. And then so please continue to make me look good by, you know, raising the bar and leveling up. Dara, you, you've chosen the right horse, I promise you. And uh, the next time you're at Dewey Show, don't be afraid to come up. Like, I'm happy to sign anything you Appreciate need. It. Like, I've got you. Thank you, Grayson. All the best to you, my friend. Take care. Good luck at SummerSlam. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you, brother. See there you soon, Dwayne. Yeah, there, <laughs> there he is, Grayson Waller. Uh, yes, SummerSlam, August 5th on Peacock. Uh, 